Let's see. Uh, on on your uh, handout, I, I uh, have Yates on the subject of magic. This this goes back in time uh, from the uh, text we were discussing last time in the teens and twenties to 1901, and I, I wanted to um, uh, introduce it to you uh, as some of Yeats's reflections on the general question of uh, the occult and of uh, the um, uh, symbolic uh, in his poetry, um, kind of preparation uh, in his thinking for uh, some of the poems we discussed last time, such as The Second Coming. Uh, he says, I believe in the practice and philosophy of what we have agreed to call magic, uh, in what I must call the evocation of spirits, though I do not know what they are. Uh, that's important. I think in, in you remember Yeats in, in The Second Coming, uh, he, you know, there's a beast that's coming, but he doesn't know what it is. Uh, and, and here he's saying something similar. He says, uh, also speaks of his belief in the power of creating magical illusions, in the visions of truth in the depths of the mind when the eyes are closed. Uh, and I believe in three doctrines, which he will conveniently put forward for us. One, uh, that the borders of our mind, and he has that in the singular there, are ever shifting, and that many minds can flow into one another, as it were. <laughs> That's probably an important uh, um, qualification. Uh, and create or reveal a single mind, a single energy, in effect, at work in our, our common imaginations. That the borders of our minds are shifting, uh, and that our memories are part of one great memory, what he calls the memory of nature herself. And this is the most important thing, that this great mind and great memory, this kind of unitary repertoire of, s of uh, 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 spirits and memories can be evoked by symbols. Uh, this is something poetry can activate and, and uh, draw upon. Uh, that spiritus mundi that, that uh, Yeats refers to in The Second Coming, well, this is Yeats talking about that idea here. Uh, <coughs> it is something, as he stresses, that can be evoked by symbols, by poetic symbols, uh, and this he intends to do in his, in his poetry. Uh, in fact, Yeats sees uh, um, his poems as a kind of summoning of spirits or evocation of spirits, as he refers to it. Uh, last time I, I talked just briefly about Yeats's interest in automatic writing, uh, a practice that he engaged in with his wife. Uh, well, his poems uh, themselves have a, an occult dimension uh, of uh, uh, evoking um, this great mind uh, and the spirits contained therein through symbols. He also stresses that the borders of our minds uh, and of individual identity are ever shifting and unstable, uh, and that, um, well, Behind all these ideas, I think, is, is a sense of um, uh, the poet as a figure who channels in his life, as well as in his writing, uh, channels spirits and presences uh, and voices, uh, importantly. Uh, and this is related to, to Yeats's idea that the poet, and this is something he, he wrote about in the prose I asked you to read uh, for today, that the poet is more type than man. Uh, on 884, uh, late in his life, uh, writing a kind of uh, summary comment on his work for the uh, 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 collected edition being produced by the publisher Scribner's, uh, he, he writes uh, certain important summary propositions about his work, but about poetry in general, and he says on 884, a poet writes always of his personal life, in his finest work out of its tragedies, whatever it may be, remorse, lost love, or mere loneliness, he never speaks directly as to someone at the breakfast table. There is always a phantasmagoria. Dante and Milton had mythologies, Shakespeare the characters of English history, of traditional romance, and so on. <coughs> uh, he says, um, uh, the 
the writer is more type than man, more passion than type. He is Lear, Romeo, Oedipus, Tiresias. He has stepped out of a play, and even the woman he loves is Rosalind, Cleopatra, never the dark lady. Uh, well, uh, he, he is part of his own phantasmagoria, and we adore him because nature has grown <coughs> intelligible, and by doing so, uh, uh, we, we apprehend a part of our creative power. Uh, in the poet and in his work, nature grows intelligible. This is an important idea for uh, Yeats. Uh, and it suggests that though life is rooted, or excuse me, that work is rooted in life for uh, Yeats, it's always uh, a life transformed, uh, uh, fed through this phantasmagoria that he's, he's discussing, uh, which is important because uh, at once Yeats is insisting on, on, uh, uh, on, on the personal nature of uh, his poetry uh, and of the experience it offers, and yet he's also, interestingly, a, a, um, a curiously impersonal uh, figure, uh, impersonal poet. On 887, he says towards the uh, uh, top of the uh, page, um, <coughs> he says, uh, talk to me of originality, and I will turn on you with rage. I am a crowd. I am a lonely man. I am nothing. Ancient salt is best packing. Uh, he, uh, the, the heroes of Shakespeare convey to us through their looks or through their metaphorical patterns of speech the sudden enlargement of their vision, their ecstasy at the approach of death. Uh, and, and so on. And this is the kind of um, uh, impersonal channeling of uh, emotion that um, uh, Yeats, himself a kind of actor in his poetry, wishes to convey. Uh, on, your, on your handout, there's another uh, uh, quotation from Ye late in Yeats's life that I wanted to emphasize. He says, uh, and here's that Yeatsian word, all, again. He says, when I try to put all into a phrase, I say, man can embody truth, but he cannot know it. Man can embody truth, but he cannot know it. I must embody it in the completion of my life. The abstract is not life, and everywhere draws out its contradictions. You can refute Hegel, but not the saint or the song of experience. That's a wonderful claim. You can, you, you can refute Hegel, but not uh, the saint or the song of experience. Um, man can embody truth, but cannot know it. This is, this is an important formulation. Uh, I think of it as a kind of reply to that famous question in Leda and the Swan. Uh, that is, did she put on his knowledge with his power? before the indifferent beak could let her drop. Uh, the answer that Yeats is giving here is different from saying either yes or no to that question. Uh, it's more uh, like saying yes and no, I think. Uh, truth is something to be embodied in Yeats, uh, embodied rather than known, uh, embodied in the sense of lived. Uh, not merely understood, but experienced, but also, I think, embodied because it is specifically a thing of the body and involves an experience of the body uh, as much as or more than the mind. Uh, what kind of knowledge, if any, can be had from the shattering experiences of revolution or rape, uh, those models of history that I proposed last time? Remember how, uh, how Yeats uh, represents history as rape in Leda and the Swan. Uh, he, he sees it there as an experience of violence, uh, of sexual violence, involving the intercourse of opposites, of God and man, uh, eternity and time, male and female, the will and patterning force of the one thing against the other imposed on it by brute force. What kind of knowledge can be had from that experience? 
Uh, Leda and the Swan seems to say uh, a knowledge of the body, uh, of the necessity of embodiment. Uh, in, in, in the late Yeats, in the poems that I'll be discussing today, uh, there's no knowledge apart from the body. Uh, and this is, this is something to contrast with the early Yeats and its high idealism uh, and its, um, uh, its drive to uh, exist in an abstract uh, and, and um, ideal world. The late Yeats, uh, this is a poetry uh, written uh, in age uh, and written about age and aging. Uh, age seen and, and experienced as the failure and corruption of the body to which the soul is bound. Uh, in, in sailing to Byzantium, uh, a, a kind of transitional poem to, to later Yeats, uh, on, on 123 in your book, um, Yeats says, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick unless soul clap its hands and, loud and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. The poet speaks of his soul there as, um, uh, as, as sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal, that is, the body. Uh, and yet, for all of the, the complaints about the body uh, here in this poem and in, 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 in other late Yeats, <coughs> the poet doesn't reject it, doesn't reject that dying animal, uh, doesn't scorn it. Uh, instead, Yeats affirms it, affirms the body uh, in its corrupt state. <coughs> uh, he, in fact, sings and sings louder uh, for it in this uh, late poetry. Uh, sings louder, as he puts it, for every tatter in the soul's mortal dress. Uh, this is the extraordinary energy of, of Yeats's late poetry. Uh, what he calls, the, the word he has for, for the energy of this uh, poetry and of this attitude towards life is joy or gaiety, uh, words that recur throughout these poems, joy, gaiety, or sometimes madness. Uh, they're, they're joy and gaiety are both states of mind associated with madness uh, in, in these poems. The body's truth, felt as an experience of joy or of gaiety, is arrived at through a kind of uh, shattering of the body and, and of the rational mind and its working. Uh, Gaiety uh, for Yeats seems to represent um, some reconstitution of, of mind and body, uh, some experience of their unity uh, out beyond an experience of tragedy and grief. Uh, this is a, a point of view specifically associated in, in Yeats's late poetry with old men and with women, particularly but not only old women. Uh, he, he says uh, on 886, back in uh, that general introduction for my work, uh, we, uh, this is interesting. He's talking here about the kind of style he wishes to uh, um, create in poetry, which involves, for him, uh, 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 making the language of poetry coincide with that of passionate, normal speech. He says, I wanted to write in this, uh, a version of Frost's ambition, uh, though conducted differently. I want to write in whatever language comes most naturally when we soliloquize, as I do all day long, upon the events of our own lives or of any life where we can see ourselves for the moment. I sometimes compare myself with, myself with the old, mad old slum women I hear denouncing and remembering. How dare you! I heard one of them say to an imaginary suitor, and you without health or home. <laughs> if I spoke my thoughts aloud, they might be as angry and as wild. Uh, so this is uh, a kind of model for the late Yeats in uh, poetry, uh, the, uh, uh, the voice 
of the angry and wild slum woman. Well, uh, in order to uh, get at this style in action in Yeats's late poems, I want to look uh, back uh, a little bit uh, at a, uh, a poem that looks back on Easter 1916, uh, the poem I discussed last time, as well as um, uh <coughs> excuse me, as well as Yeats's um, own earlier poetry. And that is uh, the poem called "In Memory of Eva Gore Booth and Con Markowitz on page 126. It's a kind of postscript to Easter 1916, uh, written in 1929. Con Markowitz was the only surviving leader of the uh, Easter Rising, uh, condemned to death, but then her <coughs> sentence was transmute, uh, trans, uh, what is it done? Um, yeah, thank you. Commuted, not transmuted. Um, uh, well, uh, Con Marquitz is, in a sense, a figure like Leda. Uh, she is someone who has suffered the traumatic <coughs> violence that engenders history. Uh, Yeats's elegy here uh, uh, recalls her youth and that of her sister, both friends of the younger Yeats, uh, Eva Gore Booth. Uh, a youth spent uh, in the Sligo mansion Lissadell, uh, where Yeats visited in 1894. Uh, at that point, Yeats was 1894. Yeats was 29, and the two women were slightly younger. Let me read the beginning of it. The light of evening, Lissadell. Great windows open to the south. Two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful. One a gazelle, but a raving autumn shears blossom from the summer's wreath. The older is condemned to death, pardoned, drags out lonely years, conspiring among the ignorant. I know not what the younger dreams, some vague utopia, and she seems, when withered, old, and skeleton gaunt, an image of such politics. Many a time I think to seek one or the other out and speak of that old Georgian mansion, mix pictures of the mind, recall that table and the talk of youth, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle. Uh, here, female beauty, 19th century manners, an aristocratic culture are all held together as if expressing each other uh, and, and associated with each other. Uh, Yeats's nostalgic vision of them is charmed uh, and static, interestingly static. Uh, see how the verb is withheld in the first sentence of the poem, uh, and then in the closing lines of that first strophe, uh, that uh, well, uh, w w in, in order to give us that image, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle, which he returns to. Uh, it's, it's as if the action itself were being withheld from this charmed world, uh, and time slowed down or even stopped, uh, making a picture, an image, a haiku. Uh, but all of this is overthrown changed utterly uh, by the radical politics that altered Ireland during Yeats's lifetime, that announced the coming of modernity, uh, and that these two women themselves participated in uh, centrally. Politics makes them ugly to Yeats. Uh, it's as if they might have maintained their beauty had they only refrained from it. Uh, you, you could look at a similar attitude in A Prayer for My Daughter, uh, another uh, important uh, big Yeats poem from a slightly earlier, uh, where Yeats says, An intellectual hatred is the worst, so let her think, his daughter, that opinions are accursed. Uh, women shouldn't have them. Uh, th this is not an attractive side of Yeats, uh, at least for, for uh, people of our moment uh, and sensibility. Uh, it, there's, there's a kind of um, 
uh, well, masculinism uh, in, in Yeats, uh, and it's part of uh, uh, what I meant last time when I, when I spoke of Yeats' uh, anti-modernism or his reactionary modernism, and it's here, too, in this poem. Uh, but the attitude here, as in Eastern 1916 and Yeats's other great <laughs> poems, is complicated. Uh, for all of Yeats' uh, reactionary moods, even for his indulgence in nostalgia here, he's not a nostalgic poet. Uh, and, and this poem, I think, shows us uh, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, look, look at how the poem uh, changes as it develops, uh, as it moves to this second strophe. Uh, and Yeats turns from the, the frozen image of the past to address those two sisters directly, uh, saying, Dear shadows, now you know it all, all the folly of a fight with a common wrong or right. The innocent and the beautiful have no enemy but time. Arise and bid me strike a match, and strike another till time catch. Should the conflagration climb, run till all the sages know. We built <coughs> the great gazebo. They convicted us of guilt. Bid me strike a match and blow. The poet and the woman together become we in the poem's last sentence. They, the they who convicted us of guilt, well, that's hard to identify. Who is that? Uh, I think it's possible to see that they as the sort of general forces of modernity, of everything at odds with the aristocratic culture Yeats and these women shared, inhabited. Uh, we, the great gazebo, built. I stumbled and put built in the wrong place <coughs> when I read it. Uh, it's a strange line. Uh, I am told uh, that it, it uh, plays on a uh, 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 slang uh, phrase, then current, to make a gazebo of yourself, meaning to make a spectacle of yourself and a fool of yourself publicly. Uh, the uh, uh, footnote to your Norton here uh, suggests um, <laughs> that mm, the gazebo is a summer house, and by extension, it's quite an extension, the nationalist movement, uh, and then even the whole temporal <laughs> world. <laughs> those, are, those are some real extensions, aren't they? Uh, it, it's a little hard to know what to do with this, this uh, gazebo. Uh, does it, in fact, represent um, the, the uh, uh, nationalist movement um, uh, that um, uh, culminated, uh, or uh, one form of uh, which culminated in the Easter Rebellion? Uh, does it represent uh, Yeats' own um, uh, early cultural nationalism and his uh, 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 the uh, 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 work uh, represented in uh, The Wind Among the Reeds and, and other early poems? Well, it's a little hard to say. I tend to see that gazebo or summer house uh, as, a, you know, as, a, as a version of Lissadell itself, uh, this um, uh, home that the poem evokes uh, and that uh, is representative of uh, a 19th century world of art, uh, of pleasure, of rarefied and delicate and ideal beauty, uh, <coughs> a world very important to Yeats. Uh, as Yeats, uh, as his thought develops in the course of this poem, uh, he uh, turns from nostalgia uh, to affirmation, uh, and seems to join the sisters uh, in the uh, actions uh, that they chose through some kind of sympathetic identification. Uh, Yeats, who had seemed to stand apart from and against them in the uh, first part of the poem. Uh, the women uh, represent uh, for Yeats a kind of self-destructive energy. Uh, and it's something uh, he, too, I think, is willing to uh, share uh, and enter into. Uh, he speaks of the destruction of the world that they shared, of the house that they had built, one that he mocks as this great gazebo. Uh, 
as something uh, noble uh, and beautiful, perhaps, but also fragile uh, and a spectacle and unable to stand up to history. Time is the enemy in the poem. Uh, it Yeats joins forces with the women at the end, uh, and d in doing so, joins forces with time uh, and sets a match to it, uh, as if time itself were tinder. Yeats imagines a, a kind of active arson in this poem. <coughs> Fire is symbolically important throughout his poetry. In the Song of Wandering Angus, uh, I talked about the, the kind of flickering passion and the fire in the head uh, that sends Angus out on his quest. Fire reappears uh, with increasing frequency in the late poetry. Uh, in in uh, your RIS packet, I gave you the uh, short poem, Two Songs from a Play. Uh, the first stanza of that interesting uh, poem uh, repeats themes from the Magi and the Second Coming. You can, you can look at uh, it uh, with those poems in mind, where Yeats imagines a, a new world coming into being, uh, ushered in through the blood of the old. Uh, this uh, idea uh, leads him to um, uh, the meditation that's in the, the uh, second stanza uh, there. Uh, Everything that man esteems endures a moment or a day. Love's pleasure drives his love away. The painter's brush consumes his dreams. The herald's cry, the soldier's tread, exhaust his glory and his might. Whatever flames upon the night, man's own resinous heart has fed. Man's heart in Yeats is resinous. It's a sticky filth that flames. The longing heart accumulates desires that become, in time, a kind of volatile waste uh, which can't be uh, contained. Uh, the heart is combustible, uh, like the, uh, the energy that insists on, on birth in the Magi or, or the Second Coming. Uh, and this is our glory, Yeats says. Uh, Again, notice how, how bodily, how material and physical Yeats's images of human energy are. Let's uh, turn back to uh, the anthology and, and look at uh, the poem Vacillation on 131. Uh, this is a meditation that comes in several parts. Um, <coughs> as Yeats's work develops, he creates a a kind of poem uh, that comes in parts, uh, that is a, we might think of as a kind of sequence poem, uh, in which, um, uh, with increasing daring, uh, Yeats explores contending viewpoints, uh, seeking uh, some kind of synthesis. Uh, that's what's going on here. Uh, that's a similar kind of structure in other late Yeats poems. Yeats uh, at first thought to call this poem, What is Joy? Uh, it takes up his lifelong quest to reconcile extremities, opposites, uh, in his thought, in his experience, and to achieve some kind of unity of, of being. Uh, what is the goal of, of Wandering Angus? Uh, between extremities, man runs his course, a brand or flaming breath comes to destroy all those antinomies of day and night. The body calls it death, the heart remorse. But if these be right, what is joy? Here in the first part of the poem, Yeats talks about death and remorse as the end of all debate. The last word. We're all going to die, and we're all going to regret what we did. <laughs> but this understanding of the end of things uh, is only the cancellation of all those antinomies in a kind of failure to reconcile them. And it doesn't satisfy Yeats. Uh, he's asking, in effect, 
how can we be joyful in the face of death and in the face of certain remorse? Or how is it that somehow we are? He wants to explain this. He wants to, he wants to find a way to not so much redeem as <laughs> affirm uh, time and age uh, and understand them uh, not simply uh, as a cause of despair uh, or as uh, a cause of defeat. The poem then tries out uh, different answers, uh, answers that uh, alternately explore transcendental and secular uh, solutions. Um, uh, and and it, the poem vacillates, uh, as it were, between them. In section three below, uh, Yeats says, get all the gold and silver that you can. Provide, provide. Uh, but uh, just as in Frost, uh, this strategy isn't going to work. So therefore, uh, we must take up, he suggests, uh, an ascetic path, uh, engaging only, as he says, in those works that are fit for such men as come proud and open-eyed and laughing to the tomb. In section four, then, the next, on the next page, uh, blessing is, is not, uh, on the other hand, something to work for. Uh, rather, uh, it's a potential fire that flashes up momentarily within us. My fiftieth year had come and gone. When I first read this poem, that seemed a really long way in my future. <laughs> uh, <coughs> as perhaps it does to you. Uh, my fiftieth year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book and empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed. In twenty minutes, more or less, it seemed so great, my happiness, that I was blessed and could bless. It's a serendipitous and, and moving uh, uh, momentary experience Yeats describes. And notice that it's the body that blazes. Uh, soul and body, or soul and heart. Uh, these are, are antinomies that the poem is exploring. Uh, Yeats insists that the heart is an organ of the body uh, and, and, and located in it. Uh, this, this is important. Uh, in in uh, uh, the sixth section down below, he, he speaks of man's blood-sodden heart. It's another turn on that image of man's resinous heart. Uh, in in uh, section seven, Soul and heart argue. Uh, the vacillation and debate uh, becomes uh, quickest here uh, as one point of view gets one line and uh, the other, uh, the uh, rhyming next line. <coughs> well, they're not in couplets, but you'll, you'll hear the rhymes <coughs> when they come. Uh, Seek out reality, leave things that seem. That's what the soul instructs us. The heart responds, what, be a singer born and lack a theme? Isaiah's coal, what more can man desire? Struck dumb in the simplicity of fire. Look on that fire, salvation walks within. What theme had Homer but original sin? It's, it's a wonderfully compressed argument. Uh, in which the, the soul and the heart make compete, keep, excuse me, competing claims for Christianity uh, and classical uh, and literary wisdom. <coughs> Yeats counterposes Isaiah's prophetic coal uh, to the blazing body of section four, uh, where fire is spontaneous, imminent, something that arises from the body. Uh, there then follows uh, in that last section a kind of comic uh, conclusion where the poet chooses to side with Homer uh, and implicitly with poetry against uh, the theologian 
uh, von Hugel, who's a kind of comic figure uh, at the end there. Uh, Vacillation. The poem was written uh, following a, a series of poems called the Crazy Jane Poems, uh, written as a kind of summary of them, a kind of resolution of the debates that go on in them. Uh, you have just one of them in your anthology, uh, but it is uh, one of the uh, uh, greatest. Uh, it is uh, back on 130. Uh, in the uh, Crazy Jane Poems, uh, the bishop, who is Crazy Jane's antagonist has the has the real the part of von Hugel, the uh, uh, position of the uh, um, church authority, <coughs> uh, and Jane speaks for Yeats and for poetry, uh, for Homer <laughs> too, I suppose. Uh, Crazy Jane is is one of uh, Yeats's masks or roles. Uh, she is a mad peasant woman. Uh, um, she, uh, uh, she speaks from the point of view of a cracked or shattered mind uh, uh, in the tradition of a Shakespearean fool. She speaks what Yeats calls in his general uh, title for this group of poems, words for music, perhaps. Uh, uh, the poem's uh, connection to music uh, signifies uh, the difference in point of view in these poems from reason speech. <coughs> it also seems to relate these poems to folk forms uh, and to the wisdom of the folk. Uh, Jane speaks in praise of love, uh, in praise of satisfaction. She speaks of the necessary unity of body and soul, which for her entails a defense of the body, uh, defending, uh, as she does, its knowledge and its goodness. As a character, she is sour, uh, <laughs> she's rank, ill-tempered, uh, pungent uh, in all senses. Uh, well, let's, let's look at this debate. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I, those breasts are flat and fallen now, those veins must soon be dry. This is the bishop uh, speaking to her of her body. Live in a heavenly mansion, not in some foul sty. To which Jane replies, Fair and foul are near of kin, and fair needs foul, I cried. My friends are gone, but that's a truth, nor grave, nor bed denied. Learned in bodily lowliness and in the heart's pride. And she continues, a woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement, for nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. The points of view, again, are those of the sacred and profane, the soul and the body. Uh, the promise of a heavenly mansion uh, and the reality of a life lived in a foul sty. The bishop claims one side of the bait, Jane claims the other. Uh, but unlike the bishop, she doesn't want to reject the other, and this is important. Speaking for the body, she speaks for the potential unity of body and soul. In answer to the promise uh, of the bishop's health, uh, heavenly mansion, in another life, she claims another sort of house, what she calls love's mansion, which is noble itself <coughs> and which is to be lived here on earth. Love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement. This is an outrageous claim. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, look at the claim it's paired with. For nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Why is it necessary to rend something to make it soul or whole? Is it necessary? Uh, only that which is broken, Jane claims, is unified. Uh, that which appears whole is not. Uh, Yeats seems to be insisting through Jane on the necessity of, of 
shattering experience to achieve unity of being, uh, which Yeats imagines, uh, again, as a union of opposites. Uh, again, think of the rape of Leda. Uh, this is the, the type of the violent union uh, that Yeats imagines, uh, in which the, the divine enters the human and the human finds access to the, to the divine through the bestial. And the bestial is identified in Yeats with the heart and with the irrational uh, and with the uncontrollable. Um, Yeats's uh, late poems uh, speak from the point of view of, of Jane more often than not. Uh, and yet, uh, powerfully, we do see him vacillating from different, uh, between different points of view. We have um, really no time left to explore them, but I want to just point you to uh, two important late poems that, that seem to uh, represent different uh, <coughs> attitudes uh, in late Yeats uh, that contrast the uh, kinds of claim that can be made for art. Uh, one of them is the uh, moving uh, valedictory to his work that is called the Circus Animals Desertion, uh, where uh, the poet um, imagines his imagination as having arisen uh, on, on ladders, if you will, out of uh, what he calls the uh, foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Uh, and in conclusion, he imagines uh, giving up um, that uh, terrific um, uh, drive towards uh, imagination and idealization uh, and, a and a return to uh, the rag and bone shop of the heart. That's an a, a image of art ultimately leading out of art uh, to a kind of state of uh, desublimation. Contrast this poem uh, to uh, Lapis Lazuli, uh, a, a uh, uh, beautiful and moving late poem on 135 uh, that is full of echoes uh, uh, from that uh, general introduction to his work uh, that I quoted from uh, earlier. Um, here, Yeats um, presents us with um, an image of art in the form of a lapis lazuli Chinese carving. Uh, <coughs> and he describes the figures on that carving who uh, are, uh, in some sense, um, uh, representatives of an attitude, again, uh, beyond uh, tragedy. Uh, beyond um, the kinds of um, uh, social and political apocalypse that uh, Yeats faced in his career uh, and that he describes also in this poem. Uh, and Yeats concludes, uh, well, with an image of the artwork uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll read for you um, that is uh, fascinating in itself, but al is also, as I suggest, uh, an image of uh, Yeats's um, late uh, ideal for what art should be like. He says, every discoloration of the stone, this is on page 136, every accidental crack or dent seems a watercourse or an avalanche or a lofty slope where it still snows, though doubtless plum or cherry branch sweetens the little halfway house those Chinamen climb towards. And I delight to imagine them seated there and in their, at their altitude, looking at the world from within uh, the perspective of art, there on the mountain and the sky, on all the tragic scene they stare. One asks for mournful melodies. Accomplished fingers begin to play. Their eyes, mid many wrinkles, their eyes, their ancient glittering eyes, are gay. Uh, and there uh, is uh, finally, again, uh, an affirmation of this uh, 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 joy uh, and, and gaiety 
uh, here seen as a, a property of the artwork itself.